This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today's conversation is with Professor Jay Loran Matori. He'll be talking about African-inspired religions. Everybody watching is invited to join the conversation. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet your question with the tag Duke Live, or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and Professor Matori, we are here at your online office hours. Let me tell everyone just a little bit about you. You are the author of Black Atlantic Religion, Tradition, Transnationalism, and Matriarchy in the Afro-Brazilian Candabla. The book won the Melville J. Herskovitz Prize for Best Book of the Year 2005 from the African Studies Association. Here at Duke, you are the chair of the Department of African and African American Studies, and you're also a professor of cultural anthropology. So, Professor Matori, uh, as we're talking about African-inspired religions in the Americas, I think we have to start with voodoo. It's been getting so much attention as people pay more and more attention to Haitian culture in the wake of the terrible earthquake down there. So uh, let's start off. You actually have some uh, voodoo objects with you. Could you tell us what is voodoo? Where did it come from? I would be happy to. First of all, thank you very much, James, for that kind introduction, and thank you for having invited me here to share with the world my passion. Absolutely. Um, well, let's see. I brought two objects uh, that are products of Haitian voodoo. The first is a Dwapo voodoo, or a Haitian voodoo flag. Now, mind you, many people call this religion voodoo, but uh, that term has acquired uh, inappropriate connotations as a result of, of its exploitation in the American film industry to project uh, all evil upon, uh, upon this religion of another group of people. So many Haitians describe it as voodoo rather than voodoo. So this is a Dwapo voodoo that, uh, that honors one of the Haitian goddesses. The goddesses and gods are called Lua, and this particular goddess is named La Siwen. She's a goddess of the waters. She's a goddess of beauty, of, 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 of mysterious depth. Um, these gods uh, protect people. They heal people in the Haitian tradition. Many people are protected by multiple gods that understand themselves to live at the crossroads of multiple beings who guide them, protect them, who manifest aspects of their personalities that they might manage those personalities better. Um, La Siwen, uh, this flag of La Siwen was produced in the atelier of Yves Telemac, who is a famous, uh, a famous flag maker in uh, Port-au-Prince. Uh, um, these flags have been made for quite some time in Vaudou, but they've reached a height of elaboration now. There was a time when uh, dressmaking factories were common in Haiti, and the imported sequins were used to make dresses that were then uh, re-exported to the U.S. and worn in weddings and such. And uh, the craftspeople would collect the fallen sequins from the ground and use them in this craft. Now that people are more prosperous and, and can sell these extravagant uh, creations overseas, they buy their own sequins and they've just been elaborated in multiple colors. So this is just an eye-popping example of the art. Another, And, and, yes. and what are the, the marks of uh, voodoo religion? So what's, uh, what is it characterized by? Very good. Voodoo is a beautiful religion of song, dance, animal sacrifice, and healing. Uh, it's a system that is heavily inspired by African cultures, by the cultures of Central Africa and of West Africa, uh, the cultures of the Fon, of the Congo, for example. And uh, it's based upon the notion that human beings are vessels of spirit. We're not simply individuals, uh, as consistent as a social security number might be throughout one's life and throughout the day. Um, we are a crossroads of multiple spirits, ancestral and otherwise, that protect us, that dwell within us, that speak through us, that heal through us. Um, we nourish these spirits in the same way that we nourish human beings, with food, with gifts, with offerings that they find beautiful. Just as we have to placate powerful people in the world uh, by ingratiating gesture through communication, through uh, generosity, through kindness, so. Haitians do with their gods. Um, the gods are celebrated through dance. Mm -hmm. um, the voodoo religion, like many other African and African diaspora religions, are full of celebration. The most important element of ritual is people coming together to celebrate the gods, to party literally, and to eat together as the gods eat. 
And, and you said that dance is actually one way that people here in the U.S. end up seeing a window on, on African-inspired religions. How's yes, that? Yes, very good. One of, the, uh, one of the greatest descriptions I've heard of these religions is that they are danced religions. Uh, these religions involve beautiful music, often drumming and always singing. Um, uh, rhythm and melody are used to call upon spirit. In fact, in many West African cultures, drums can actually speak. They mime the, uh, the intonation of tonal language and can actually speak to the audience and speak to the gods. People dance to these rhythms, and dance has not only the effect of bringing joy, but changing the body chemistry in such a way that uh, induces what we call spirit possession. That is, a change in consciousness that people who practice these religions understand to be the entry of a new being into the body, and typically uh, uh, regard that being as displacing the self. The body becomes a vehicle of another being, and the self actually forgets or does not know what's going on at that time. So one's body becomes a medium of communication between the gods and a broader community. Now, in talking about voodoo, and as people in the U.S. have been paying more attention to it recently in, in the news, there has been some controversy, and uh, I know this quote isn't new to you, but uh, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, yes. he wrote, there is the influence of the voodoo religion in Haiti, which spreads the message that life is capricious and planning futile. There are high levels of social mistrust. Responsibility is often not internalized. I don't know if David Brooks is listening right now, but what would your response be back to him in, in, in uh, discourse here? I, I hope he is listening and hope he hears it eventually. Um, I appreciate Mr. Brooks' efforts to understand another people's culture, but my first advice would be look in the mirror. Mm, what do you mean? Well, that is to say, um, when we characterize other people's cultures, often what emerges is our preoccupations about our own culture, which we project onto others. Um, I would also recommend that, like an anthropologist, he actually spends some time with some vaudevisant. Now, there are snippets of truth in what's he, what he says, but there are also snippets of truth about our culture. So, for example, regarding the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, non-internalization, the alleged non-internalization of responsibility, one of our consistent critiques of our own culture over the last 30 to 40 years has been the denial of personal responsibility. For example, you remember when the, the lady spilled the McDonald's coffee on her lap <laughs> and we said how ridiculous that she should blame McDonald's for having spilled coffee on her own lap. Um, the insanity defense that suggests that somehow we weren't in control of ourselves or if having eaten sugar makes us somehow do things that we're not responsible for. And of course, in the current economic crisis in which, as everyone knows, a deregulated economic market persuaded some people that they could invest in derivatives and derivatives of derivatives and derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, knowing full well that these were highly risky ventures. Now our government has intervened to pay them off. Mm -hmm. to guarantee the survival of these institutions and indeed to subsidize the wealth of the people who did this. What is this but irresponsibility? Now it's not clear to me that in any way Haitian voodoo encourages irresponsibility. In fact, extensive planning goes into the practice of these religions. Um, annual festivals require planning and saving by people who have limited resources. And furthermore, Haitian voodoo structures networks of mutual assistance uh, whereby people who are devoted to the same God, people who are descended from the same ancestors, must coordinate their efforts to help anyone who is sick, to help anyone who is homeless, to help anyone who needs labor on his or her farm or in reconstructing his or her home in a disaster. Um, Haitian render, uh, Vodou renders the world intelligible for people and structures how they respond together to their problems. Now, I might add one more backstory. Um, concerning levels of mistrust. Mm -hmm. Now, if there were evidence uh, plain and patent of social mistrust in any society, it's the tea parties. In our own society, the levels of social mistrust are very, very high. We mistrust the foreigner, we mistrust the ethnic and racial other, we tend to mistrust the government. That's the very foundation of our political system. And by Tea Party, you mean the political movement Tea Party. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. That in relatively uh, uncoordinated and not uh, rationally opposed ways, they, this tea, the Tea Party movement manifests a high level of mistrust. The shared premise is mistrust of the government and the people who occupy it, which may or may not be justified. 
In fact, governments often betray their people, as is the experience of the Haitian people. They have regularly been betrayed by their governments and elites who are cooperating with metropolitan elites to extract and to exploit the Haitian people. So sometimes social mistrust is logical and reasonable. It does follow from one's circumstances. But there's the further backdrop that's almost literary, almost Shakespearean, whereas on the one hand, the culture that's generated much of university life and uni univer thinking in the university, and in fact has shaped my thinking about the world, is that people are what they appear like. If people tell you they like you, you want to believe that they like you. If people smile at you, you want to believe that they're happy. Um, but the truth is, most peoples in the world don't think that way. Okay. Only the privileged, the people who've been protected from the ill effects of other people's ill will, can truly believe they don't have to worry about what's behind a smiling face. Um, the religions of the African diaspora uh, are not simply survivals of a primordial past, but they're a response to circumstances in which uh, people and their ancestors have been kidnapped by people they might have expected to, to trust. The truth is that among all peoples, you can't be sure what a person feels about you. There's a proverb in Yoruba that goes, uh, that means it's the people we love that we know. We don't really know who loves us. Now, if you take that to be an undue or irrational type of mistrust, because you grew up in a culture where you were supposed to pretend you knew other people's hearts, fine. But uh, the greatest literary works, even of our own culture, suggest that people are more complex than they appear. And furthermore, we know from contemporary science that people can affect each other. When, if, if I hate you, sometimes you can feel it. Mm -hmm. When people feel hostile toward me, I can feel it. People, African Americans' blood pressures are notoriously <laughs> higher than those of white Americans. And it's partly because this, of the stress of being stigmatized mm -hmm. and mistreated by large numbers of people around you. So part of the logic of these religions is, number one, that human beings can affect each other. And number two, that you don't always know who intends good and who intends ill for you. So you must be careful you must think about the complexities of human beings. Most Americans know that too, but we don't tend to acknowledge it publicly or in our religious practice. Very good. We've got uh, about 170 people participating in our online oh, office hours wonderful. session. And we've got an email question here that's come in from Ava, uh, and she notes the differences in terms between voodoo, voodoo uh, and voodoo, three different spellings there. Very and then good. she also says, please discuss the significance of trees in Haitian oh. voodoo. Oh, how wonderful. Well, um, dialects of Haitian Creole, which is the national language of Haiti, really, so most people don't speak French, they speak Creole, vary, uh, just as the languages of the West African coast vary. So the same word can be pronounced voodoo, 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 etc. And all of them are valid pronunciations. However, um, Haitians and scholars have tended to prefer the term voodoo in recent decades because the term voodoo has come to be associated with sticking needles and dolls and such, which has nothing to do with Haitian voodoo. Um, so uh, let's see. So uh, voodoo or voodoo in a series of West African languages, Eve, Gen, Aja, and Fon, means a god that is one of the uh, servants of and representatives of the high god on this planet and among human beings. Um, in Haiti, it has come to refer to an entire religion, and the gods are called the loi, or the mystères, or mysteries. Uh, trees are very significant in many of these religions, including Haitian voodoo. Uh, trees are understood to be uh, very profound manifestations of life um, as deep-rooted connections to the uh, underworld, or to heaven, or to Guinea. Uh, some trees are associated with very beneficent connections to the ancestors. Others are associated with, uh, with connections to malevolent forces. Um, the natural world provides symbols for much that happens in the social world and in the ancestral world. Uh, the potomiton, which is in effect uh, a tree, a central post in every Haitian peristyle or, or temple is essentially the pillar that connects uh, heavenly and underworld forces with human life, and it's what people dance around. Um, I could go into greater detail. There are. Uh, no, that, I, 
I think that's great. That's that's a good to start. W I should add that they're an important source of herbal medicine. Okay. Um, that uh, that Haitian voodoo priests are regularly also healers, and they use herbs as the first uh, the first uh, uh, medical treatment of uh, of the first recourse of medical treatment. Very good. We've been talking about uh, voodoo so far, voodoo, yes. and uh, but there are other faiths that have yeah. come to the Americas from Africa, you even have some okay. objects, uh, Santeria and some of these others. So, so give us uh, an overview, the landscape of faiths that came to the Americas from Africa. Very good. Um, at, at the risk of, of being simplistic, I'll sort of introduce you to the outlines of Please. the West African and West Central African religions uh, that I've studied and that have influenced the religions in the Americas. First, probably the most widespread, least common denominator of these religions is profound respect for the ancestors and recognition for the role that the physically dead continue to play in human social life. Um, for example, this reliquary figure comes from uh, the Kota people of Gabon. Uh, the Kota people, after having buried their, uh, their loved ones, uh, exhume the long bones and skulls and bring those into the house, uh, uh, housing them in a beautiful sack and placing this reliquary figure on top of that sack. So this reliquary figure represents the ancestors, their continuing force in people's lives, their protective force, their vigilance over people's lives. It's believed that the ancestors can help us to prosper and yet can, uh, without their protection, we would not prosper and we would be uh, we would be uh, subject to ill and capricious forces in the universe. Likewise, uh, uh, in, in many places in the world, uh, in historic times, infant mortality rates have been high. So among Yoruba people, for example, uh, the dead children are not forgotten. Twins, for example, are sacred for Yoruba people. So this iribeji, or a twin image, is what's produced after the death of a twin, and it's cared for in the same way that the living twin would be cared for. So the role of the physically dead in our lives continues. A second important uh, aspect of these traditions is that they order society. Just as Christianity legitimized kings and other worldly forces, so these religions uh, help to legitimize and guide uh, authority structures in society. They also um, uh, provide systems of healing, healing that addresses physical ills, ills that we would call mental and misfortune, that helps people coordinate in the resolution of these problems. So in the Americas, these religions were brought as, uh, as some of the primary riches that enslaved people could carry with them, systems of healing, of social order, uh, and of, of caring for ancestors just as we care for ourselves and soliciting their help. Uh, so, for example, uh, this object uh, was commissioned by uh, a man in Miami uh, in honor of two gods who confer converge prominently in his life. His father is Agayu, the lord of the volcano, and his mother is Yemaya. She is the lord of the ocean. And these are the, the biological mother or the, sort of the spiritual? No. Okay, good go question. Yeah. Yes, they, they refer to these phenomena without distinguishing biological and, 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 and spiritual. Uh, parenthood, but that's a good point. So they are his, uh, his, his spiritual parents. They're the gods who most govern and protect him in the world and who sometimes arrive in his body when, uh, when the right music is played in the right ritual context. Uh, Yemaya will take over his body and he will dance and heal and speak, uh, or actually Yemaya will dance, heal, and speak using his mouth and his hands. Uh, Agayu's prominent colors are, are brown and, uh, and white, uh, as well as these varied colors. Yemaya's colors are white or clear and blue. Her sacred number is seven. She's closely associated with the ocean, with motherhood. And uh, I also uh, brought this vessel. This is a mortar for one of the most famous of the gods brought from Africa by uh, people who landed in Haiti, in Cuba, in Trinidad, in the United States, and in Brazil. Uh, Chango is the god of thunder and lightning, as his name is pronounced in Cuba. It's pronounced Chango in Trinidad, Chango in Brazil, but Chango in Nigeria. Tonal difference, basically. Now, 
it represents for me uh, the notion that human beings are vessels, vessels that can contain multiple spirits. And you can't see it, but the top of this mortar is hollow. Um, typically, it will contain stones that symbolize the god. It's a mortar in the sense that this god of thunder and lightning is metaphorically associated with the pounding of the pestle in the mortar. Um, it's also a beautiful object to me and, and recalls the symbolic uh, representation of the god as uh, associated with the colors red and white, uh, with his fiery spirit, with his dangerousness, which is red. He's dangerous in relation to thieves, witches, evildoers in the world. Um, he is associated with the ram, much like Greco-Roman gods of thunder and lightning. Um, so hence the, uh, the stylized ram's horns uh, that you can see on the figure. So uh, let's see. I also brought this uh, voodoo necklace. This is a necklace that's worn by priests of Haitian voodoo. Should I lift it up? And it represents the multiplicity of spirits, each represented by a particular color and numerical combination of beads that they, it's not actually a necklace, it's wrapped around the body. Should I put it on? Or would sure. that be too let's, cumbersome? Let's, uh, let's see it. I'm told it will cause a noise on the uh, microphone, so I'm going to be very careful. But I, my wearing it will illustrate how uh, the spirits are understood to envelop people, not just hang around their necks decoratively, but to envelop the whole body and the whole life, much as community does. Human beings individually are communities of spirits, just as community becomes a, a natural extension, an inextricable extension of the human being. That is a great introduction, Professor Matori, and I should say we've got uh, about 200 people now participating in this office hours. And uh, we've got a question. You mentioned the Santeria faith, and uh, we've got a question along those lines. A reminder to everybody watching that you can ask Professor Matori a question. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu. Tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. So the question here comes from Elizabeth, and she references the book Santeria from Africa to the New World by George Brandon which discusses the importance of Santeria to New York and Miami after the 1959 revolution in Cuba mm -hmm. as an important phase in the development of the religion. Yes. How would you say that the U.S. Santeria and the Cuban Santeria differ today? Should they even be considered different religions? Very good. Well, first, I, I hope the audience understands the backdrop, and that is after the 1959 revolution in Cuba, uh, many Cubans left the island and came to the United States, but also went to Venezuela, Cuba, Puerto Rico, all over Latin America. Thus, uh, Santeria, or Ocha, as most practitioners prefer to call it these days, has spread all over the Americas, taking a uniquely Cuban-inflected interpretation of, of African religions all over the New World. Um, this particular version of an African-inspired religion recognizes the, uh, the importance of Roman Catholic saints in representing the African gods, or Roman Catholic saints as versions of the African gods. In many ways, uh, these, uh, the, the Catholic saints and the African gods uh, embody the same logic, and that is that there are multiple representatives of and uh, sort of uh, 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 central embodiments of divinity on earth whom we can call upon. So in the United States, uh, the 1959 uh, exodus reconstituted these religions in Miami and in New York. Many of these were very prosperous, middle class and upper middle class white people. But they came to associate their island closely with Santeria, their memories of music that they heard of healing systems that they and their relatives had resorted to only episodically. They were not, uh, they were considered things of black people and things of, uh, let's see, not to be associated with people of their class and of their race, but they came to embrace them more fully than ever before uh, as a result of nostalgia in the United States. Uh, they cultivated a very prosperous commercial uh, community in, in Miami so that the religion as practiced in Miami nowadays is fabulously wealthy. It's wealthier, the only place where it is wealthier is in Sao Paulo, which is the industrial capital of, of, of Latin America. But uh, the material culture has been elaborated extraordinarily. It's disproportionately influenced by the particular kind of religiosity that was, was practiced in Havana, the capital of the island. Now, uh, on the island, uh, 
this religious system is much more diverse. Uh, Havana has its own forms of practice, Matanzas has its own forms of practice, El Oriente has its own forms of practice uh, that are highly diverse. Um, it's had a very ambivalent relationship with the socialist revolution. Uh, many uh, underprivileged Cubans were extraordinarily happy about the revolution that expelled Batista and uh, brought Castro to power and associated his power with uh, the triumph of Obatala, who's the lord of peace, of prosperity, of wisdom, who's also associated with Jesus Christ. They remember very clearly there was a time when Fidel came and he, he delivered a, a post-victory speech and a dove landed on his shoulder. And they regarded that as a sign that he was blessed by Obatala, uh, chiefly by Obatala, seldom was Jesus mentioned. Now, like all religion in Cuba, uh, it uh, came to attract the disapproval initially of the socialist revolution. But eventually, in the 1980s and 90s, the government came to regard uh, uh, Santeria or Ocha as a favorable alternative to a European-dominated and capitalist-dominated Catholic Church. So some aspects of this religion, particularly various unions of babalaos or diviners, are now sponsored by the Cuban government in ways that have reshaped its structure. Um, the, uh, the local neighborhood councils are often involved in authorizing the purchase of animals and regulating who can purchase animals for sacrifice and so forth. So it's actually become an aspect of, of, of the socialist uh, order in Cuba, uh, in, very differently from the United States. Great. In talking about that mixing of Santeria and Catholic Christianity, we've got an email question here that comes from Jacqueline. Along those lines, she says, can you talk about some Africanisms or customs from West African religions that have been adopted by the black church in the U.S.? Very good. I should mention one more thing in Thanks. connection with the last question, mm -hmm. and that is there's been a widespread movement in the United States to extricate the Catholic saints from Ocha, particularly led by African Americans, but many Cubans are involved. And this movement has prevailed much more greatly in the United States than in Cuba. Okay. Now, Africanisms uh, in this question clearly alludes to the argument of Melville J. Herskovitz, who is an anthropologist who in the 1940s wrote a book called The Myth of the Negro Past, in which he argued that African-American culture and American culture generally was not simply the product of an imitation of Europe or, uh, or a product of North American social circumstances that, uh, that kept people impoverished or unable to practice European culture. In, uh, in ways thought ideal by middle class people. But rather, uh, African American culture and American culture generally was distinguished from European culture by the ways in which African cultures had influenced it. Let me repeat that. The difference between European cultures and American cultures was specifically the influence of Africa. So, for example, it was understood that various forms of American music, including soul music and gospel and samba and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, merengue, were all African-inflected performance forms. There was also the hypothesis that, uh, that uh, uh, charismatic forms of Christianity, practiced as, for example, Pentecostalism, were directly inspired by African spirit possession. But rather than African gods taking over the body and dancing and speaking and healing through the use of a human body, the Holy Spirit does so. And the forms of dance associated with it, as far as Melville J. Herskovitz was concerned, uh, were, were shaped by, uh, by an African legacy. Um, uh, Herskovitz discussed the ways in which African-American tastes in clothing and colors were shaped by African aesthetics as well. Um, he also argued that uh, white Americans were influenced by these cultures, that the cuisine of the South, for example, and deep fat frying and uh, the f southern forms of speech were shaped by an African legacy. And, uh, and he's generated a, a long tradition of scholarship about this issue. I hope I've answered the question. Yes, I think so. And in talking about these faiths, um, we haven't spent much time on Candobla, mm -hmm. um, a, a faith based out of uh, Brazil, yes. and one that uh, you studied quite a bit and even become a, a practitioner of sorts. So could you tell that story? You, you tell it in part in your book, um, A Black Atlantic Religion, yes. through your friendship with a Candobla priest, yes. Pai Francisco. Yes. So what's that, what's that story? Okay, well, um, 
probably the uh, most publicly prominent version of this religion is Brazilian candomblé. Uh, that is a religion that, like Santeria, combines uh, respect for the Catholic saints with respect for African gods, and in addition to that, incorporates certain spirits that are understood to be Native American spirits and ancestral spirits and so forth. In Brazil, it has achieved a higher level of official recognition and, and elite sponsorship than any place else. Um, it has uh, sizable temples, especially in Bahia, but in the industrial capital, the most modern city of, and most industrial city of Brazil, the temples are lavish and enjoy the sponsorship of politicians, of business people, of doctors and lawyers and so forth. Um, I went to Brazil first because uh, I understood through the book of uh, Roger Bastide, The African Religions of Brazil, that Candomblé was a very important link between, on the one hand, the cultures of the African diaspora, and on the other hand, the cultures of West and West Central Africa. I'd always wanted to figure out what was African about me and about people of my hue in the Americas. So um, after having spent some time in Nigeria, I then spent time in Brazil and time again in Nigeria, the foundation of which was my dissertation. And um, I, the, my best friend in Brazil continues to be uh, Pai Francisco, we'll call him, just to, to preserve his, his anonymity. But uh, when I first walked into his temple, um, these, these temples always have a space for uh, the general public and a space where initiates and highly respected practitioners of the religion are allowed to enter. I'd been taken there by some initiate friends of mine, and even though uh, on this occasion of a sacrifice for the Lord of the Crossroads and unpredictability, Eshu, they were excluded, I was invited into the inner sanctum, and it was because he looked at me and he immediately believed that I was African. The backdrop being that during the 1970s and 80s, a time when Nigeria was very prosperous with oil money, they were sending students to countries all over the world, including Brazil, uh, to study and to teach, to trade and so forth. And uh, he thought I was African and therefore brought some knowledge that would be valuable to him in uh, cultivating his religion. Um, he was always uh, selflessly kind to me. He took care of me when I was sick. When uh, someone, he said, uh, uh, was envious of me, had sent a malevolent issue after me, he cleansed me. And you know, hence, uh, you're, you're noting that in a way I've become a practitioner. Indeed, whenever people um, I believe love me ask me to do something or tell me, don't do that for your own good, I'll do what they tell me to do, and I'll avoid doing what they tell me not to do. <laughs> and uh, so we've stayed friends for, for these decades now, and uh, he's always taken care of me and uh, keeps a watchful eye over my career, among other things. Um, the other, the other uh, point that this story illustrates is that what is African about uh, the African-inspired cultures of the Americas didn't just come with enslaved people. There's been a back and forth movement of people, of mutual glances, of mutual imitation between Africans and people in the African diaspora for centuries. Uh, in the 19th century, for example, there was a continual flow of people between, uh, on the one hand, Bahia and Rio, and even Havana, and Lagos, um, such that much of the architecture of Lagos, that is the capital of Nigeria, uh, is Brazilian architecture. It's designed in direct imitation of the houses uh, that were built by Afro-Brazilians before they returned to West Africa. And likewise, as merchants, they would move back and forth. They would bring African products to the Americas to sell to religious people, and at the same time take salted meat and tobacco and, and rum to West Africa to sell it. So there's been a mutual influence and commerce among these populations for quite some time. We've got and I'm part of it. <laughs> great. We've got an email question that uh, follows up along those lines. It comes from Barbara Ann, and she says, how did you come to study African religions? Good. Was this always your academic interest? Mm -hmm. Well, it goes far back beyond my, my academic life. I, uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and uh, my mother's father was a Pentecostal bishop in Norfolk, Virginia. He actually founded a whole series of churches in the Church of God in Christ in, uh, in Virginia. Now, while my mother was a backslider, uh, my father made sure we got to church. And he took us to this hinkty black middle class Baptist church in our neighborhood, which always bored me to tears, I'm sorry to say. But <laughs> when I would go to Virginia 
during the summers, I would sit at my grandfather's church and witness people who were upstanding, respectable, elderly people, and now I realize in hindsight, were often old enough to be arthritic, as I am in my left hip now, and I know that what I actually saw them perform under the influence of the Holy Spirit was extraordinary. It was just impressive to me then, but now it's extraordinary to me. These people who were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s filled with the Holy Spirit would suddenly dance and move like young people. And there, was, there were certain typical dances that are already in my body from having seen it so often. The phrases from their speaking in tongues are still in my head like, And these are gifts of the Holy Spirit cultivated in this church. And I was always dumbstruck at watching them. Only later in the academy did I discover Melville J. Herskovitz's explanation of these phenomena, that, uh, that not only did they embody spirit, uh, something sacred and powerful, but they had something to do with an African legacy. And of course, being growing up African-American in the United States, I was sort of privileged. I grew up in a neighborhood of black professionals, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs in the, How in the shadow of Howard University. So it had never dawned on me that blackness was not normal or that black accomplishment was not normal. But then watching television um, and receiving from television the idea that the norm of humanity was white and furthermore blonde was an alienating experience. So naturally, like other kids, I wondered, hmm, what does my skin color mean about who I am inside? Um, and one thing that it meant in the 1970s, um, uh, after the black power movement um, and uh, amid uh, the independence and increasing prosperity of many African nations was uh, African culture. What did it have to do with African culture? And Melville J. Herskovitz issued me into at least one route of answering that question, which I later modified a bit, but uh, the lessons were strong and it became a very inspiring thing to study. Good. Professor Matori, we've got about 230 people participating mm. in online office hours now, and everyone watching can ask a question of Professor Matori. To do that, send it by email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet it with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. Uh, we've, of course, been talking about African spirituality. We've got an email here that's come from Tanzania. Justin Dar es Salaam asks, I would be interested in hearing Professor Matori's perspective on how religious and political leaders are navigating successfully or unsuccessfully the contradictions between the practices of traditional religions and current social norms and rule of law. For instance, today in Tanzania and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa, albinos are targets of body parts traders. Many end up murder victims fueled by the m demand from traditional witch doctors. Are there examples of proactive leaders that are addressing these contradictions without turning their back completely on traditional religions? Well, very good. First, uh, crimes of that sort, I think every African government is trying to combat uh, just as crimes inspired by religiosity in the United States and, and Turkey and, and Italy, we, we try to combat, for example, uh, honor killing uh, based upon uh, religious senses of, of honor in the family uh, take place in many parts of the world and, uh, and there are variable efforts to, to correct those phenomena. Um, I would be very careful, though, about judging these practices traditional. Uh, what's very clear is that uh, uh, Practices inspired by our religious vocabulary change constantly over time. And uh, practices such as the ones that, that you point out of albino killing uh, are, are regularly products of modern, interpret, let's see, responses to feelings of modern alienation, responses to conditions of, impover of, of impoverishment, of exclusion from, uh, from a, a world capital system, of exclusion from governance, uh, marginalization from, uh, uh, from, from the uh, main sources of livelihood and people figuring out as best they can how to seek inclusion, sometimes in ways that are very, very unkind. Um, capitalism uh, is a prime example of, uh, of a context in which deep unkindness to other people and deep exploitation of other people is used to guarantee the prosperity of others, slavery, for example. Um, now, uh, the, the logic that, uh, that the human body is the main source and symbol of human wealth is widespread in African societies. 
whereas in much of Eurasia, control over land was the least common denominator of the generation of wealth before the Industrial Revolution. In much of Africa, land was plentiful, and what determined how much you could produce was how many people were loyal to you, how many people you could persuade had your same interests at heart, or how many people you could persuade owe something to you just as you owe something to them. That's a system that anthropologists call wealth in people. The, most, the greatest value in just about every sub-Saharan African society is children. Children are the greatest of all wealth. There is no cash that is worth as much as children, hence childlessness is considered a terrible and shameful failing. By extension, human bodies are the main source of wealth. If I can make my body work better, if I can draw on the energies of other people's bodies, I will prosper more. This very, very seldom leads a person, a person literally needs to be insane to want to sacrifice another human being to his or her best interest. But remember, this is a symbol deeply embedded in Christianity as well. The idea that Christ's death and Christ's blood nourish and protect us. The, the idea that God would have his only begotten son killed for our benefit is the same logic. Uh, and Christian human beings, in the name of Satanism, which really is just uh, a, another interpretation of Christianity, conduct similar practices. So, again, I would have reservations about calling it a traditional practice. I would have reservations about attributing these phenomena uniquely to African logics of, uh, of, of wealth and prosperity and healing. Um, and I would also say that um, rather than being contradictions to the rule of law, certain responses of the alienated, of the impoverished, are actually reactions to what's quite unfair in the legally sanctioned distribution of wealth and social well-being in, in, in society. People who find no means of prospering often try to think of sub rosa or ritual means of prospering. And uh, sometimes they are zero-sum games, as in, the, uh, 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 as in the slave trade or as in, uh, in uh, forms of for even praying, for example, people praying for their side in a war to conquer the other side in the war as though God were on our side and in favor of our killing the other. That's a very common logic in Christianity. You've mentioned here uh, Christianity and then, and then the opposite of the, the devil worship, and of course, I think we have to address... Or the complement to devil worship. Uh, the it, symbolism of Satanism is, is really Christian symbolism turned upside down. Backwards, okay. And then, uh, of course, a point of controversy, you're talking about voodoo, was Pat Robertson's remarks that historically, going back to the slave revolt in Haiti some 200 mm -hmm. years ago, that uh, he says, well, those leaders swore a pact with the devil and the yes. effects are being felt today. So, again, not sure if he's listening, but what, yes. what would your response be to that? Very good. Well, um, this is, again, an example of zero-sum logic. Monotheistic faiths often posit that the religions of other people are literally devil worship. They are the opposite. Uh, and, uh, and Haitian people tell the story of the oath at the Bois Caimon on the eve of the revolution, where around the sacrifice of a black pig, people gathered together and swore an oath of solidarity and of secrecy that guaranteed the success of their rebellion against the French. Subsequent uh, uh, historians uh, uh, have uh, inferred that this alleged oath may have been the invention of French journalists. We don't know for sure, but Haitians uh, regularly uh, acknowledge and commemorate uh, this alleged happening as, uh, as an instance of how uh, African culture and the solidarity among the oppressed uh, around oaths helped the success of their revolution against slavery. Um, I hope that Pat Robertson uh, would not suggest that uh, their enslavement was good or that, uh, that God sanctioned their enslavement, but it's certainly true that uh, many generations of Christian apologists for slavery did justify it in terms of service for their God in terms of the will of their God. Uh, if indeed rebelling against the will of that God is classified as devil worship, um, surely at least we can say that's how uh, some uh, non-justice loving Christians reason. Uh, but we might say alternatively 
that, uh, that African religions, just as Christianity uh, has done at times, can be the armature of rebellion against one's oppressors, especially when one's oppressors think that God is on their side. Mm -hmm. And there would have been Christians on both sides. Exactly. Like the abolitionists. Exactly. Okay. And so, uh, Professor Matori, we've got uh, 300 people participating now mm -hmm. in the office hours. And everyone watching can ask a question. To do that, send an email to live at duke.edu. Tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. We've been talking about uh, voodoo in Haiti. We've got an email question here that comes from Victor, and he says, I understand that homosexuality in Haitian voodoo is religiously acceptable, mm -hmm. although some Christian influence may have given homosexuality a social stigma. Is it true that Haitian voodoo has remained open to people of all sexual orientations? Very good. It's absolutely true. Most of these religions are, let's see, let me put it, way, put it this way. Uh, it is a highly prominent logic of the Judeo-Christian religions that homosexuality is bad. And part of the history of that fact is that in many of the antecedent religions, such as the worship of the Baalim in Palestine, homosexuality was among the practices considered sacred that distinguished priests and divine personages from other people. Um, in the African and African-inspired religions, the uh, notion that, uh, that homosexuality is categorically bad or ought to be the opposite of good practice is, uh, is quite rare. The notion that it was somehow uh, or is somehow uh, immoral is rare. What is true is that procreation is the highest value but the value given to women in procreative processes often make them highly prominent symbols of contact with the divine. Um, so that uh, in, in West Africa, male transvestism is, is very commonly associated with the, uh, with the highest positions in the worship of African gods. Now that's not to say that men's wearing women's clothes is the same as homosexuality, but these uh, forms of gender bending are part of the history behind which in religions like Candomblé and Vodou and Ocha, not only is uh, what we call homosexuality not a sin, but uh, it is uh, uh, regularly, uh, it, is, it regularly complements the symbolism of the divine. Now, that is to say that uh, not only are Let's, let me be clear about the meaning of the term homosexuality. We understand homosexuality in the, the early 21st century and latter half of the 20th century in the United States as a person of one sex loving a member of the same sex or engaging in sexual acts with a person of the same sex. In much of the world, including the Mediterranean influence world, that's not really the most prominent uh, means of defining the phenomenon. Uh, historically. That is to say, in much of Brazil, the people who are classified as distinctive are not any man who loves another man, but men who are penetrated and are therefore somehow like women in the sexual act. And regularly they're associated with female professions and female bodily affect and so forth. And this category of people has regularly been conflated with the West African sorts of transvestism, such that in the 1930s and 40s, it was considered quite normal for these transvestite and what anthropologists called passive male homosexuals to be highly admired practitioners of the tradition and highly admired as, as, as spirit possession priests. Uh, people who out, from outside the candomblé appreciated it looking in, regarded them as very beautiful practitioners of these traditions. And it is true, furthermore, that the influence of Christianity and of the outside gaze, uh, particularly uh, a North American anthropologist named Ruth Landis, who sought in Candomblé an example of female, of, of matriarchy, of, uh, of, of, of female supreme dignity in a religion, uh, of which Candomblé was a manifestation, required her to dismiss these quote-unquote passive male homosexuals as not really part of the legitimate, re the legitimate religion. Uh, consequently, there has been a, a, a discourse or an ethic in this religion since then, shaped by the fact that middle-class sponsors in the government 
are uh, more inclined to support the ritual activities and temples of female priests or priestesses than of these male priests. Uh, but uh, it's widely understood in both uh, Ocha and Candomblé uh, that, uh, that uh, gay men and lesbian women are just as acceptable a part of these traditions as quote-unquote straight people and that uh, in fact uh, in the Cuban diaspora as a result of not having uh, responsibility for as many children as straight people that, uh, that gay men have been responsible for disseminating this religion in an especially elaborate and beautiful way. Professor Matori, we've, we've been covering a lot of ground here. I'm, uh, as we start to, to wrap things up here, I'm wondering how you hold these um, different worldviews together. I mean, you grew up uh, in the church in uh, Washington, D.C. Yes. Uh, you've spent your life in the academy with yes. a you know, sense of objectivity and, and that yes. sort of study, and then you've um, participated and practiced some of these uh, African-inspired faiths. Uh, what what holds it together? Yes. Well, long before I was an anthropologist, I was an anthropologist. I have been fascinated by people who are different from me. God knows I love people who are like me. Uh, but uh, to me, there's nothing more fascinating than hearing a different perspective on the world, than trying that perspective on, seeing what it illuminates about my own life. Um, I love trees. I love paintings, I love horses, I find them quite beautiful, but nothing is more fascinating to me than other human beings. And uh, I always learn something from them. Hello. The following portion of this interview concerns the limits and virtues of cultural relativity. It has been edited with my consent for two reasons. First, Two of my colleagues were so deeply hurt by one example that I gave that they were unable to perceive the analytical context of that example. Secondly, high-ranking officials of the university who are aware of the possibility of internet scandals worried that words of mine might be cut and pasted so as to create the impression that I had told an abominable joke. In fact, I quoted an abominable joke told by German friends, as well as what I regard as an equally abominable story, that illustrate for me that nations who sense themselves to be innocent victims sometimes regard their victimization of others as innocent. And this lesson does not apply to German people alone. Because I have seen fit to expurgate the riddle and the punchline that had previously appeared in this interview, you will not have an opportunity to evaluate the quality of my evidence or to consider further implications of it. However, as I thought further about this joke, I realized that it might teach us two additional lessons. One is that jokes are clearly part of the vehicle and mechanism of racism and of discrimination against others. And the special way in which jokes work is that they invite laughter and the suspension of disbelief. On the other hand, this joke, which you will not have the opportunity to hear immediately, reveals a quality of many jokes. They rely on the listener's recognition that what is a verbal possibility or conceivability is actually commonsensically absurd which reinforces the message and feeling with which I began the story and this portion of the interview. And that is, the people of every culture are equally capable of grievous self-justification and of righteous self-critique. Thank you. I leave the rest of this interview for you to judge and evaluate. And what about, you probably hear this sometimes, but um you know, at some point you need to make a judgment, not everything can be relative. Yeah. So, so uh, how do you hold that tension of wanting to understand, put yourself in someone else's shoes, but at the end of the day, you know, making choices about what you believe right and wrong? Yes, very good. I'm a very justice-minded person. I'm highly intolerant of what I consider unfairness or untruth, and, uh, and I fight for what I think is true and fair. Um, on the other hand, I always assume that even my worst enemy has a perspective on the situation that I would benefit by understanding. Um, 
I guess, you know, the, the greatest illustration of this, I think it, it alludes back to Pat Robertson's projections, David Brooks' projections on another culture. It's very convenient to project all evil onto other people. Um, but if you want to understand the thing that they're doing that you consider bad, there's at least a, a minor form of cultural relativism that one has to undertake. One has to ask, how does the world look from their point of view? Why is it that a person whom I must assume is just as rational as I would think and do that, even though in my circumstances and where I grew up, I would never consider doing it? Even if I want to stop them from doing it, it behooves me to understand why they think they're doing it so I can talk to them about it. Now, there's a stronger form of cultural relativism that's illustrated by something like this. Um, I made uh, a very close German friend in the late 80s, somebody I met in London, again, somebody else who liked difference. And I would regularly go to his family home for Easter and Christmas. And they would tell, the, the, these people were nice to me than any white American family had ever been to me, despite the reputation of German people for racism. And yet, on occasion, they would do things like telling me a joke. And I said, I don't want to hear this. And I'd say, that's not funny. And they would tell me, oh, you Americans take things so seriously. Oh, you can't take a joke. And they couldn't understand my sense of moral outrage at those thoughts. And so in those ways, I could sort of understand the image that we receive in American movies about how evil Germans are. Even their language comes out ugly in our movies. They are what we point to when we want to typify evil, the thing that no one must ever be. On the other hand, they would tell me stories like this. They would say, you know, Randy, you know, I know what happened back in the 30s and 40s. It was bad. But, you know, you have to understand. You have to understand, you know, those Jews, they were very clever. They were very clever. They would go to a farm and they would tell a German farmer, oh, I can see that your cow is sick. I'd be happy to buy him off of you before he dies to save you the, the, the trouble. And the simple, innocent German farmer would, would hand over the cow for a pittance, but then the Jewish trader would go on to the next farm and sell the cow to someone else. And you see, you know, they were just so clever. You have to understand. I said, well, I don't understand. But I came to think about this when I got home. I watched Forrest Gump soon thereafter. And I recognized that even in the context of the Vietnam War, Americans can wreak the most horrible destruction on other peoples, vilifying them as, as a terrible other. And after we have wrecked this destruction, we forgive ourselves. We say, oh, we were just innocent like Forrest Gump. We were just innocent like Mr. Smith who goes to Washington. We didn't, even if we made a mistake, we didn't really know what we were doing. It's that we innocents have been taken advantage of those clever, crafty people over there, whether we call them savages or terrorists or Nazis, etc. We think the Germans think of themselves as, as geniuses. We think of them as evil geniuses over there, while they're thinking of themselves as simple, innocent people. And so, by hearing their story in comparison to our story, I realized that part of the problem with us too, part of the reason that we commit heinous evils, is that we think we're innocent, simple victims. That's how we see ourselves. But then we kill enormous numbers of people every year, unprecedented numbers of people, but still forgive ourselves as innocent. So it's not that they're good, it's not that I have to accept them as good. It's just that I see the potential for self-rationalization and self-justification in every culture. I see the potential for doing good and being self-critical in every culture. And if, for example, as we accuse the Chinese of violating human rights, we also listen carefully to their accusations. What are you talking about? You have homeless people wandering in your streets when you could take care of them. You discriminate against African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans. Instead of, say, instead of ignoring them, we should say, you're right. We can improve based upon your advice, but persuade them that they can improve based upon our advice, too. Professor Matori, we have got time for one last final question, just a couple minutes here, uh, maybe end on, on an upbeat. Um, so it, this question comes from Stuart by email, and he asks, 
how might the strong community values we see in Haiti in the voodoo religion serve to help the country face the challenges ahead? Very good. What a wonderful question. And how might those strong family values help us? These people under duress for 200 years as a result of creating the first black republic and the first revolution of enslaved people in the Americas, what lessons might it teach us? But the Haitian people and their religion have generated a system of cooperation that is not only local, in which people come together in order to preserve and honor their ancestors, but at the same time are helping and feeding each other, but they have also cultivated this system transnationally. The Haitian diaspora, hardworking, enterprising, and talented is regularly a part of these networks that subsidize uh, worship in Haiti and the honoring of ancestors, and that's also healed by people. So these family networks, I have no doubt, can be instrumental in channeling resources and in cooperating at the sort of translocal level that all economic development has to take these days. Um, the forms of, uh, of labor cooperative, um, such as uh, combit, that is people who help each other to rebuild on each person's uh, home properties in turn, can be instrumental in the redevelopment of Haiti. And I hope that international NGOs and governments will focus not simply on rebuilding a government, on subsidizing centralized administration, but on uh, offering ways in which organic forms of social solidarity and cooperation in Haiti can be used to, uh, to help Haitian people progress. Um, let's see, there's one other thing. That's a good, uh, a good charge. Thank you for holding You're these welcome. online office hours. It's a pleasure. This has been great. <laughs> Everyone watching is invited to follow the work of Professor Matori and Duke's Department of African and African American Studies. To do that, visit AAAS.duke.edu. You can return here to Duke's Ustream channel next Tuesday at 11 in the morning when the director of Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, Tim Profeta, will interview the former CEO and chairman of DuPont, Charles Holliday Jr. You can find a recording of this office hour session along with many more Duke videos on the new Duke On Demand website. That's at ondemand.duke.edu. And of course, to learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.